So good afternoon all. I, Dr. Kavita Manrele, Professor and Head, Department of Ops and Gaini CMC Ludhiana. I welcome you all to this Saturday afternoon CME. And we all know that we are celebrating International Women's Day every year. That is uh, on 8th of March that we celebrate. But CMC is celebrating International Women's Week because being a Saturday, we all are free. So instead of doing it on a Monday, we decided to do it on a Saturday afternoon. So this is a virtual CME. And today's discussion will be, the theme is cervical cancer screening and prevention. This is the need of the hour. And on behalf of the Department of Ops and Gaini CMC Ludhiana, I welcome our chief guest, Dr. Lakbir Dhariwal, who is a CMC alumnus. And all our very eminent and dynamic speakers, Dr. Neerja Bhatla, Dr. Sarita Sham Sundar, and our very own Dr. Anita Sabarwal. I also welcome our chairpersons, Dr. Sujata Sharma, Dr. Parneet Kaur, Dr. Vidhu Motgil, Dr. Surjit Kaur, Dr. Lajia Devi Goyal, and Dr. Gitanjali Kaur. I welcome all the esteemed seniors, faculty, and friends. International Women's Day is celebrated on March 8th every year. CMC Ludhiana, as I said, is celebrating International Women's Week. We can celebrate International Women's Month or throughout the year. This day and week is symbolic of the historic journey women around the world have taken to better their lives. It comes as a reminder that while a lot has been changed, the journey is long and a lot more needs to be done. So the theme for this year's International Women's Day is choose to challenge, and it indicates a challenged world, which is an alert world. And from challenge comes change. So this year we can choose to challenge everything that has been holding us back and become a better person, a better healthcare provider. CMC Ludhiana celebrates International Women's Week by taking up the WHO call for cervical cancer elimination. Cervical cancer is one cancer which can be prevented and cured. Actually, it can be eliminated. So there is a global movement to eliminate cervical cancer. It is both preventable and curable. So this is the global vision requiring a coordinated effort. For the first time, we can eliminate a specific cancer. WHO provides a roadmap through the 90-70-90 targets for 2030. And the eminent speakers are going to take us through these targets one by one. 90% of girls need to be fully vaccinated by age 15. 70% of women screened should be at least twice in their lifetime at 35 years and 45 years and 90% of women who are identified with cervical disease need to be treated. Together, let's commit to women everywhere, especially women in the marginalized communities to end cervical cancer. So let us begin with the virtual CME, the theme for which is cervical cancer screening and prevention. Before we go ahead, I would like to introduce our chief guest, Dr. Lakbir Dhariwal, I hope my screen is visible. No, your screen is not visible, okay. Dr. Kavita. Sorry. So I have the privilege and honor to introduce our very worthy, eminent Dr. Lakbir Dhariwal. She has done her DGO and MD from CMC Ludhiana. She was the former head of the Department of Obs and Gyne at PGI Chandigarh. Former director in charge, WHO and ICMR Collaborative, Center for Research in Human Reproduction. Former president of Zangaini Society of Northern India. She has done research publications more than 200, research presentations more than 250. Completed 60 projects of government agencies. My screen is not visible. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. Never mind. Not yet, but they can do it for you. 
Dr. Lakbir Dhariwal has been a CMCite and she is a former HOD from PGI Chandigarh, former director in charge, WHO and ICMR Collaborative Center for Research in Human Reproduction. She is the former president of the Gynae Society of Northern India. She has mm -hmm. publications, more than 200 research presentations, more than 200. She has done 60 projects of government agencies with WHO, ICMR, DBT, and DST. Her field of specialization is infertility and ART, reproductive endocrinology and oncology. Presently, she's working as a senior consultant, Fortis Multi-Speciality mm -hmm. Hospital, Milan, Fertility Center at Chandigarh. So we welcome Dr. Lakbir Dharewal, who is the chief guest for our virtual mm -hmm. CME today. Welcome, ma'am, and the stage is yours now. Okay. I would like you to please say a few words. Yeah. Good afternoon, colleagues. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Dr. Kavita, on behalf of CMC and Dudhyana OB Gaini Society to have me here with all of you. Uh, actually, it is a smart move to celebrate International Women's Week rather than just a day so that we can discuss more, more topics and more talks and all. And uh, Dr. Kavita has already discussed the importance of International Women's Day. And we, it was uh, incepted in 1911. So it's 110 years uh, senior Women's Day. And uh, women have played an oversized role now, especially this year in the pandemic code COVID as frontline health workers, as caregivers at home, and mobilizers in the communities, in their communities. Doing all this, we have to continue making the gender equality, keep, keep it up higher. It was rightly said by G.D. Anderson. I'll just uh, read his quote. Feminism, feminism is not about making women stronger. They are already strong. It's about changing the way the world perceives their strength. So it is so rightly said. As ob specialists, what we can do, how we, we can make women strong, uh, physically as well as mentally. In, we can make them strong in all phases of their life, starting from adolescence. Let's try to prevent anemia. So young girls, um, about uh, they should not be anemic before they get married and their menstrual hygiene, contraception guidance and about the knowledge of reproductive system as such, which I'm happy is being done in, at the school level programs. And the reproductive age, yes, pregnancy should be planned, planning pregnancy and preconception counseling. We all should help them for this and uh, PCC means preconception counseling about blood group, thalassemia, rubella, all these things. We should make them aware and they should do this before they plan a pregnancy. Then about uh, good pregnancy care, which fortunately is being done now at low cost. Spacing contraception, yes, it is our duty to advise them. And then more important, cancer prevention, cancer awareness. And uh, prevention, and we know this, the topic today, cervical cancer. Yes, it can be prevented. It is amenable to prevention and uh, treatment at the early stage or pre-cancer stage also. So that is should be done. And we know uh, cancer prevention and detection is much more cost effective than the treatment of the cancer cervix, definitely. So we should emphasize on this lot of guidelines, operational framework, training modules for the trainers, for trainees, for program managers have been made by WHO uh, for the CR countries and the Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research uh, of ICMR wing at Delhi and Government of India, for which Dr. Nirza would agree with me, so much hard work we all had put making these guidelines, which are feasible in the existing infrastructure of the government centers. But somehow these have to be made operational. I hope Dr. Nija, you put in a bit more effort to get these operational. Now, whenever there is a gathering of CMC, I can't stop saying few words about CMC. I feel very fortunate that I was trained at CMC. 
CMC is the institute where value-based and cost-effective management is taught, definitely. Where a lot of stress is laid on clinical assessment, observation, and selective use of investigations, not ordering all the investigation as a battery in the first visit at OPD. And not to start antibiotics, we were taught, I hope it is continuing, Kavita, not, yes, to start, not to start antibiotics till cultures are sent for whatever we are thinking where the infection is. And we were taught at that stage. And till today, I do not start antibiotics till I've sent some cultures. Now, after 40 years of this, WH and ICMR guidelines have come for the same that antibiotics should not be used without a basis. A speculum examination must for each coming patient coming to gynae OPD, which we were taught. But sadly, it is not being done now in the present scenario. The speculum examination itself, visual inspection of cervix and vagina itself is a screening tool, a very good tool for uh, cervical cancer detection and uh, its early pickup and treatment. Uh, it's actually very sad that speculum examination does not exist in the OPD tray in many of the centers, government as well as private. So that, that, that is very, very unfortunate. Now the training is becoming, or at least uh, specialists are becoming high-tech gadgets knowledgeable. So ultrasound, CT, MRI would be ordered, but a good speculum examination is uh, not time do, being done by most of us. That is actually really sad. Uh, I just want to tell you here, the infertility treatment is now ultrasound, AMH, and ART based by and large in most of the centers where cervix is only seen first time at the time of embryo transfer. And one case which came, we came to know very late, that she was detected to have a growth at the cervix at the time of embryo transfer. Biopsy from that was cell carcinoma. So we should not go to that stage. With just these few words, I'll just uh, say thank you again. And Dr. Kavita, good you chose a topic which we all should go on discussing and laying stress on this. Now best these, um, our speakers, they will tell us all how to go about this. Thank you, Kavita, again, and the Ludhiana Society. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful and inspiring message that you have given to us. And it's always that ma'am lays stress on the basics of OBS and gynae. That is such a wonderful thing to hear from you, that we need to do a speculum examination, especially when the need of the hour is to screen and prevent cervical cancer, to eliminate it. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful words. And you're almost always with, welcome to CMC Ludhiana, your alma mater. So now we move ahead with the uh, program. And uh, I would like to invite the chairpersons. So the first chairperson for the talk is Dr. Sunita Goel. She is a professor currently serving at CMC Ludhiana. She was the former head of Department of OBS and Gynae. She has done MD, FICOG, fellowship in uh, minimal access surgery. She has a clinical and academic experience of 32 years, attended more than 100 regional, national, international conferences, presented papers, participated in panel discussions and chaired sessions. She's been the examiner for undergraduate, postgraduates, and DNB examination reviewer for many journals. Her area of special interest is high-risk pregnancy, reproductive endocrinology, and operative laparoscopy. And she is a great teacher, has a great passion for teaching undergraduates and postgraduates. She is the regional faculty for conducting certificate course in gestational diabetes mellitus and has more than 25 publications in national and international journals. The second uh, uh, chairperson is Dr. Sujata Sharma. She is a professor and head of the department at Government Medical College Amritsar and the president of Amritsar OBS and Gynae Society. I welcome both chairpersons uh, to take over for the first talk 
which is on uh, global strategy for cervical cancer screening and elimination. Over to the chairpersons, please. A very good afternoon to all present. Uh, I am very privileged to introduce Dr. Nirja Batla. Uh, I don't think she needs any introduction. She is such a well-known figure. And uh, we are, uh, I'm uh, really, uh, you know, uh, feeling great that Dr. Kavita invited her. She's amongst us today. So she's professor and unit head department of ob Ames, New Delhi. Uh, she has a keen interest in gynae oncology. As you can see in the slide that she is a, uh, lots of gynae onco committees where mm -hmm. she is chairperson or council member. So she's council member of Asian Society of Gynae Oncology, uh, secretary general of IFCPC, past chairperson FIGO Gynae Onco Committee, past chairperson Gynae Onco Committee, past president Association of Gynae Oncologists of India, uh, past president Asia Oceania Research Organization on Genital Infections and Neoplasia, founder president AOGIN India, She's past secretary of Narchi Delhi branch, past vice president AOGD. She's national corresponding auditor. She was uh, of Jogi 2015-16. Uh, she's editor of the book, which every ob resident has read is international edition of Jeff Court's Principle of Gynecology. She has authored more than 250 articles in national and international journals, contributed more than 60 book chapters, She's presented over 700 lectures in national and international conferences and CMEs, uh, numerous research projects and clinical trials. She's a recipient of several orations, UICC ICR ETT Fellowship, IGSCS Awards. The list is endless. So we are lucky to have you amongst us, Dr. Nirja, and uh, I'm sure the audience is going to enjoy your lecture. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Sunita Goel, for such a kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Sujata Sharma. Nice to see you. And Madam Lakhbir Daliwal, how much work we have done uh, together under her guidance and exemplary. She has been a leader beyond anything I can compare. Dr. Kavita, Dr. Anita, who have facilitated my being with this August gathering. I can see so many, many familiar faces, so many new people. It's always such a pleasure. I wish we could come there and be there, but yet we will have to wait, it looks like, for some time. So I am going to share my screen for this topic, which has been given to me today on the global strategy for cervical cancer elimination, which has already been alluded to by uh, uh, Dr. Kavita, Dr. Lakhbir Dhaliwal. And uh, so if we go and forward a little bit looking at it, and all of you by now I'm sure are familiar that this global can uh, uh, comes out every few years with the latest updated estimates of uh, all cancers, mortality in all countries, incidence and mortality uh, by IARC, which is WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer. And the latest one has come now in 2020 for cervical cancer, if you compare with the previous one, the color codes more or less remain the same. The darkest codes mean the highest incidence. We were in the second highest, then we are in the second highest now. And yet it is a little disturbing and I will tell you why. These are again the mortality figures. It, there is no doubt it remains a disease of inequity. It remain, remains predominantly in countries which have underserved populations, Asia, Africa, Latin America, these are the countries which are suffering the uh, brunt and uh, they are the ones who don't have access. But if we look at this global can for a minute beyond cervical cancer, we see that it is really, really sad that number one cancer in both sexes, both sexes, all ages is breast more than lung in both the sexes combined is breast. So as a totality of the sexes, uh, both sexes also, and we see that cervix uteri still figures as an important one given that it's only for women, but it also means that it is absolutely not ethical now to do only cervical cancer screening. 
suppressed always was the domain of the gynecologist to do the screening and we must oh, actually has come with a good health seeking behavior can i ask everybody else to mute themselves please thank you so if she has come to us with a good health seeking behavior if we have made a facility for somebody to be screened we must take them together and we must screen for the breast examination as well as the cervical examination now you look only at the women this is global worldwide breast has almost a quarter of the pie in the women and cervical cancer in the global reckoning comes to the number 4 position after colorectal and lung and these are picking up in our parts of the world too and if we look at the deaths again it is the same ratio the breast is the first the cervix is the fourth and we have lung and colorectum interchanging their place for the deaths because we know it is more fatal now coming back to the new cases of cervix cancer india which was steadily showing decline in global can estimates and had gone down to the five figure level last time is back to six digit 123907 cases per year new cases this is 20.5% of the global and it is probably now the one in the participants i can i request everybody to mute so this is more than even the number of new cases in china and you can see that numbers are india china and indonesia half the burden ma'am i have muted everybody now so sound should not be a problem uh dr neerja ma'am you have to unmute yourself please unmute yourself ma'am Can we uh, unmute her? Ask her to unmute. Okay, is this okay now? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. You can hear me. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yes, ma'am. We can hear you, but the uh, slide has disappeared. Yeah, because I couldn't find out how. Yeah. To okay. Now mind. it has come. Yeah. yeah. So India has this disturbing situation now of being the highest contributor in both the incidents, which is hundred and twenty three thousand nine hundred and seven cases, seven lakh back, and in the deaths are seventy seven thousand three hundred forty eight. This is something like our COVID graph, you know, going down, going back up again. Will it still go up? Will it come down again? A lot is in our own hands. this is how it is the breakdown for india breast is the commonest in all the cancer registries now and cervix is number 2 and then comes the ovarian which we see more as gynecologist but this is the total fact and unfortunately the number of deaths you see the blue is the new cases the red is the deaths the mortality is very high because the patients are coming in advance <laughs> these are cancers which can be detected early breast and cervix cervix can be prevented because it has a precancerous phase that can be treated and yet they come to us advanced and madam taliwal has already spoken about the importance of simple techniques to downstage and detect early our age standardized rate which was down uh, to 14.7 is back at 18 per 100000 women 
the deaths have climbed from 9.3 to 11.4, and the proportion of prevalent cases is now to 42.8. And what I mentioned about the inequity, if you look at the human development index, you see that this is predominantly seen in the low um, uh, income countries, and it is relatively later age-wise than it is in the developed countries. And this is partly because it is a slow growing cancer presenting late. So you see a shift and you see them older. When you start detecting them earlier, you will see them earlier. Now this global strategy story actually started in May of 2018 when Dr. Tedros made this announcement of a um, global call for elimination of cervical cancer. And we must understand what is elimination as opposed to eradication. It doesn't mean there will be no cervical cancer anymore like smallpox has been eradicated. It means that it will be reduced to a level that is containable, controllable and manageable. And at that time, I, when I was the chair of the FIGO Oncology Committee, we organized a side effect uh, event at the World Health Assembly at Geneva, where Dr. Purandre made the statement, he was then the president of FIGO, that too often women who are now being saved by the reduction in maternal mortality are dying instead from cervical cancer, a preventable disease because our political will and all efforts increasing of institutional delivery uh, rates has resulted in a significant improvement in maternal mortality. If we can do it for one condition, we can surely do it for another. And maternal mortality, which gives us so little time to act in so many uh, situations of PPH, obstructed labor, and yet we are able to manage it. There is no reason why we cannot manage cervical cancer prevention, which is, gives us so much time. It is such a, a slow growing cancer. So moving forward from 2018 May and a lot of events that were going on, a lot of subgroups that were working at, the time, uh, to, at various aspects of the prevention strategy, in 2020, on the 17th of November, we had the global rollout of the cervical cancer uh, prevention strategy, the, the global strategy for cervical cancer elimination. There were a lot of events around me and, and many of you have participated in the events in India. And in fact, there were monuments around the world which were coloring up in the teal color which has been made for cervical cancer and in India with Cancer Foundation of India efforts, the Port Authority at Howrah also lit up in teal. So this is what Dr. Kavita was referring to, 90, 70, 90. So I say, you know, the uh, numbers for uh, beauty were considered 36, 24, 36. Now the color uh, numbers for good health are 90, 70, 90. So uh, what does this uh, mean? As we said, that, that it is going to make it a rare cancer. Threshold is less than four cases of cervical cancer per 100,000 women years. If they are less than six of any cancer, it is considered a rare cancer. So if by 2030, we can reach these targets that we put in systems that can vaccinate all the girls uh, not all, 90% of the girls by 15 years of age. If we can ensure that 70% of women will be screened with an effective test like an HPV test just twice at 35 and 45. And if we can ensure that 90% of those who are detected with an uh, abnormal test will receive the treatment, then we can hope that we will in due course have this low uh, numbers and by doing so we will achieve the SDG target 3.4 of a 30% reduction in mortality from cervical cancer. So this is the three pillar approach essentially and this is what, the, in, uh, what India has also signed party to. Now I'm not going to go into the depths of all these which are going to be dealt with very nicely by the speakers that follow but just to say that George Papanicolaou did this huge contribution by developing this test, uh, which uh, painlessly detected 
uh, the pre-cancer lesions and very, very long ago, I mean, it's a, a, a really literally decades ago showed that you would be able to detect more and more in C2 cancers. So the invasive would decrease, the mortality would decrease. And 70% of women at least have benefited from this. But since we couldn't do it, and what we couldn't do more, most of all was not just setting up the labs and the people, but to be able to do this repeatedly, which was required for the PAP because it has a poor sensitivity. So you need to do it repeatedly. And that is where it scores because this natural history is so long that it gives you the opportunity to act even if you missed it once. But we couldn't put the labs, we didn't have the uh, money to uh, call women back again and again and all of that. So VI and Billy came to the fore, large effort from Dr. Shankar, who was at IR for several years, to show in very large studies that the sensitivity could be compared with the sensitivity of PAP. But the poorer specificity was there. So a large number of false positives and how to manage them. And moreover, what to do with the postmenopausal women because there, when the squamocolumna junction recedes into the canal and you cannot see the entire transformation zone. But yet it remains one of the best tests because all levels of healthcare workers can be taught. And this is where Dr. Dhaliwal has contributed hugely to the development of these training modules. But you do need to train and retrain them because uh, it is a very subjective test relatively. But you just need a freshly prepared 5% acetic acid and one minute later you look. So you have instant results and you can even consider in some cases to do the screen and treat immediately. The Willy has not been popular in the program because maintaining the uh, supply chain of this relatively expensive ingredient hasn't been as simple and it is good enough really to do the VIA. And everything that changed after Harold Zurhausen uh, sort of discovered that the oncogenic types of HPV are the ones that are necessary cause of cervical cancer, persistent infection by high risk HPV is the necessary cause of cervical cancer. And all that we knew from epidemiology about why certain women will and certain women won't get cancers so all fit into this eventually, that did they have the cofactors that would work with this HPV infection to lead to integration of the virus and causation of cancer. From then it was just a step to the development of HPV tests and HPV vaccines. But what we are looking for now is the point of care test because we want the patient to get the report and get the treatment and not get lost to follow up. And there are a few that are available which are not exactly ideal because care HPV is affordable relatively, relatively, but it is not a batch, it's still a batch test. It still needs to collect the batch, then the time is shorter, but it is still required. Gene Expert is coming up very well. True Nat is coming up very well. And I think the development of COVID-based uh, tests is going to help because it is going to uh, give us new platforms that are widely available. So this is still expensive, Gene Expert. It's very rapid. It's one patient, one hour, you get the results. So it's a patient-based thing. But if we get the Avantage test, that would be great because that would be a strip test. So yes, we are still looking for the answers. But if you look at the countries which have large scale cervical cancer screening and you think back to where the disease is, you see that with the exception of South America, really no country has been able to put in proper screening programs. And uh, these are really uh, the HPV tests uh, based programs, again, are very, very few in the countries where they are needed most. And in India, we really have had them only as pilots. So we still don't have the ideal answer at all. And then we have a lot of resistance from gynecologists 
to incorporating a screen and treat mechanism. They want it should be biopsy proved before we will agree to treat it. And for the woman in the periphery, this may work for the patient who comes to your clinic. In some cases, even there it won't. And the see and treat actually evolved from colposcopy clinics because even there women may not come back. But for the woman in the periphery who has taken this decision to go to screening at one facility, come back with the report of whether it's positive or not, and then gone to the next one and she's positive to get her colposcopy done, it's a difficult task. And then again, if this biopsy is done, then she has to go back then again a third time to get the report there. And then they were, she's told, no, you don't uh, fit the ablation criteria. You have to go to the next one to get the leap. And then she goes over there, but they say, oh no, you know, you have an invasive cancer and now you need to go. It's not surprising the women drop out, you know, it, look at their resources, look at the way it is. So it, we must not let the ideal be the enemy of the good. And we must go with the point of care tests and we must go with the screen and treat approaches which are the only answer. And these are the ones which have higher ne incremental net monetary benefit values if you can assure the treatment. And HPV testing has another benefit of self-sampling, which is being hugely promoted by WHO for the hard to reach women. And this again shows a higher screening uptake and we have seen that you could get 98% of women to provide a satisfactory self-sample with a 94% concordance. So can we achieve a 70% coverage of screening and treatment of cervical precancer? Yes, we can, but we have to expand our coverage. We have to include other cadres of health workers. We have to outreach to the last mile facility, incorporating a single visit approach and we have to move to the digital era to have digital solutions for tracking and follow up. And I am happy to tell you that our president, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, has taken this up very seriously and launched a project on 8th of May in the Northeast eight states. And although we are, of course, not able to get yet the HPV tests, unfortunately, but we are going to start at least with VI, if not with HPV. Also, the vaccination are comprehensive, and then hopefully there'll be a model that we can roll out to the rest of the country. And this is to augment the efforts of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, which has been able to roll this out in the 200 districts. But every gynecologist counts if we have to make this movement a success because screening alone is not going to save lives. It's the treatment of screen detected lesions and you can still do a visual assessment for the treat, screen and treat approach or use the portable colposcopes for a colposcopy and treat approach and use the battery operated portable colposcopes and thermal ablators even at the last mile facilities or train the health workers to capture and transmit images or use one of the ones with incorporation of AI for diagnosis. So it is an amazing uh, choice out there. We are facilitating this development at Ames of Serva, which will incorporate in the same device, a portable colposcope and a thermal ablator. And the images are excellent, excellent that you get with these. This is the pocket colposcope of Duke. Oh, I didn't uh, show this one, but it really looks like a transvaginal ultrasound with a beautiful uh, quality of lens at the tip. And you can see the kind of pictures you can get. And you can use the sweet score to guide whether you want to do the treatment at the same time or not, because at a cutoff of five, it has 100% sensitivity. At a cutoff of eight, the specificity is high at 96%. So risk of over treatment is very low. And then coming to the vaccination, which has been shown to be safe and effective in multiple large trials as well as effective for not just cervical, but vulvar and vaginal pre-invasive and invasive lesions. And now we have the non-availant vaccine, which has restricted availability and not in all countries, but I can tell you it was going to come to India in 2023 as per original plan. But now because of COVID and some countries not wanting to launch yet, it's going to be available in India from May. There are some Chinese vaccines, of course, and the Indian vaccine by Serum Institute, which is now a household uh, name. We have the phase three trial ongoing. So hopefully by the end of the year, 
we will be able to have the Indian and a very affordable and a good quadrivalent vaccine. So again, when you look at the HPV vaccine introduction, although it's in more than 130 countries, but you see most of these are not where the burden lies, except again, South America, which has negotiated good prices with PAHO and managed to implement it. And then if you look again by the World Bank category, you see the same problem of inequity. Most of the countries who have the vaccine are the well-to-do ones. It is very few countries who have managed with Gavi to get it really. And the most of the ones who do not have the vaccine are the ones with the high burden of disease. But Gavi is working progressively to introduce this and it is coming. There are many people who would like to see it given to the boys also, but it has been seen that the modeling shows that the vaccination of the girls is the more effective one. And since there is a shortage paradoxically of the vaccine, WHO recommends waiting till there's enough vaccine for the girls. But then there's another very good news, which is that a single dose of HPV vaccine also can help in preventing. And this is data from our Indian multicentric trial led by Dr. Shankar which showed because of a serendipitous sort of a situation where the trial was paused and some girls got only the one vaccine and as we continue to follow up, we see that although their antibody titers are not very much uh, higher as compared to the properly dosed ones, but the, uh, this, even the single dose is ending up with infection rates comparable to, I, I shouldn't say lower than because numbers are small still, but really comparable to the ones who had received the three dose as well. So we continue to follow up and because there is a very positive information from this trial, WHO is awaiting the results from a randomized trial because this is observational, it was empowered but they have said that for the time being, you can consider a delayed second dose up to three to five years. Waiting does not harm. Many people ask the question, the vaccine has not been available because of COVID, we could not give it. It's fine. The longer the gap, they actually have a better response. It is, and you can give the second dose later. So by three to five years, when you find that uh, the results of the randomized trial, they are expected to say one dose is enough. If they don't, you can always give the second dose three to five years later. So it is immunogenic and provides lasting protection is what we have seen. So even a systematic review, which has been done on the evidence from the existing trials has found the same. So I'm not going to go there into this uh, uh, in detail. But one thing that has been against the vaccination by some of the anti-vax groups has been that we have only been able to show in the trials the reduction in CIN2 plus and CIN2, CIN3 mainly. But uh, although we've never understood this objection because we very well accept that if we treat the CIN2 and 3 by screening, we will not have cancer. So why this doesn't apply to vaccine was never clearly understood. It, it's the same thing that if you prevent CIN23, you will prevent cancer. But now we have actual info, uh, data coming from Sweden, which has shown the impact of HPV vaccine, where they have compared about uh, one and a half, 1.67 million uh, Swedish girls and women with previous HPV vaccination and no previous diagnosis of invasive cervical cancer. They've compared the ones who received at least one dose with the ones who did not. And they have compared how many of those received a diagnosis because you know these Nordic registries are very, very thorough. And they have seen that there is a significant benefit in the, uh, to the incidence of cervical cancer according to the HPV vaccination status. And you can see with the, uh, the follow-up, the unvaccinated, versus those who were vaccinated at 17 to 30 years of age versus those who were vaccinated before 17 years of age. So I think it is clear evidence to show you that the girls must be vaccinated before they are sexually active to get the proper benefit. It is good to vaccinate later, better than none at all, but really, this is not where you have to put your money. This is where you have to put it on the girls who are young. So I will not go into the details of the numbers because I think that picture speaks 
Uh, of course, they couldn't capture the number of vaccine doses in each person because this is a different type of a registry. It couldn't uh, account for factors such as screening, but we expect that they were compliant being in the country which they were. So this is the model which Karen Canfell et al. have developed that if you give only one do, if you give nothing, this is how it will be. And they go to the model to the next uh, century. And if you give girls only vaccination, uh, once in lifetime uh, treatment and cancer uh, screening, this is the thing you get, which is remarkably different from what it will be if you did only girls only. So even if to this girls only vaccination, you add a once in lifetime screening by a good test like HPV and ensure cancer treatment to the ones who have the illness, you can see that you can advance by a good 40, 50 years, the curve comes this way. And you will have by just vaccination a 90% reduction and by adding the twice in lifetime screening a 97% reduction. And you can see here that if you did this, the countries that you have by the time of the century from the red, which indicates the high in incidence, you will reach the blue. I will just briefly last, I'm not going to take very much longer, just once touch upon the palliation, which every gynecologist must do. Treatment, of course, I do hope that as girls, cases are detected earlier, we will have every medical college equipped for radical hysterectomies, but every gynecologist must look into palliation and giving women the dignity with which they have to live if they are sufferers, because there are a lot of problems that cause these women to be socially um, uh, sort of rejected as well as feel terrible themselves. So they really must ensure palliative care is not end of life care. It's a continuum of care which starts right from the diagnosis and continues through the illness and even beyond to the family members. So please use every opportunity to create awareness and this is one of the videos made by one of our people here on the 17th of November, because global really is the need of our rural or urban or poor. Every woman has to come in, everyone counts. So thank you for your patient hearing. I hope you are all coming to IFCPC 1st to 5th July, 2021 for the Congress. And I hope for your support in the it comes this year. So thank you very much for this opportunity to join you today. Can I ask the uh, chairpersons to please uh, go ahead with the discussion after Dr. Nija has taken the presentation? Are the chairpersons there? Dr. Sunita, Dr. Surjit Kaur. Will they join? I will say Dr. Neerja. The talk was wonderful as usual, but this time it was the best. Very good. The global study and up-to-date data, very good, very nice. I think if we take, uh, all of us take this cervical cancer that seriously, we can really prevent it. It was too good. Thank you, madam. Thank uh, you. So this much. was really, really a very nice talk. As usual, Dr. Neja, uh, you are a pillar, pillar uh, uh, in yourself as as a person who is a pioneer in pioneering this process of for the project of prevention of cancer. There are such critical measures that we can take and the strategy of screen and treat and promoting that strategy across all gynecology groups. I think that should be the one strategy which should take us to a great and dramatic reduction in um, incidence and reducing the incidence of cervical cancer. And your very basic references and then to high-end references to the labor emphasizing the role of even a single dose um, of uh, vaccination being given to the girls and then can go a long way in prevention of the condition. I think these strategies need to be emphasized to government of India and the importance of including cervical vaccination in EPI program, at least for the girls for the time being, that would be, that should be strategy which we need to talk to the government of India 
uh, if we really want to reduce the incidence which was going down, but then now is again bouncing back. We are having the considerable number of patients right now. Uh, unfortunately, very unfortunately, that even these days we are getting to see patients of cervical cancer in an advanced stage. Very little uh, number of patients we get who are operable. By the time they come, they are already into stage two, stage three, and this is really unfortunate. And your talk, I think, should go a long way in sending a message across all the gynecology groups that uh, cancer screening and cancer prevention, screen and treat strategy should be the strategy if we really want to have some considerable figures in our country as well. Thank you for such a wonderful talk as, as always. Thank you, madam. Uh, I think Dr. Maninder Ahuja is here and she wanted to say something. Ma'am, can you yeah. unmute yourself and talk yes, please? Yes, I have unmuted myself. Um, thank you for allowing me to unmute myself. Dr. Lakhmi, Most welcome. Dhaliwal, if you, yeah, Dr. Lakhmi Dhaliwal, if you remember, as my vice president, 13, 14, I had visited PGI and my topic was on the cervical cancer screening also because that was the agenda I was given. And at that time also, I had said that HPV DNA is the future and it is cost effective and still Nija, as we say, whatever is available, we should be doing. But if we go into the cost effectiveness, so if we have to do it for once in five times, five years, or once in a lifetime, HPV DNA testing, so it's going to make it cost effective. The only thing is we are not thinking in those terms. Cytology, until unless it's well, the LBC with HPV DNA as a reflex, then only it's going to help. But I tell you, Vaya and Billy can be taught to each and every paramedical staff. They just have to see five to 10 cases and anybody can make out if the color change is there. And that is the strategy for a poor country like ours. If we cannot do anything more, this is what we should be doing. Yes, it's shameful. We still have to teach our undergraduates and postgraduates the use of a speculum. Perhaps many of don't even know how to properly insert it. So that is perhaps somewhere along the line of this, what I am talking about under Society of Meaningful Life Management is change in the our basic curriculum of teaching also. If we really have to fight these non-communicable diseases in the future, which are really disastrous for the health of this woman. And Nija, your talk as usual was wonderful and I wish you best for your future Vice President of Foxy. My you. all good wishes to you and all support to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. And it is nice looking at Sujata Sharma and Lakhveer and everybody and Anita Sabarwal also there. And Sarita, of course, is very close to my heart always. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Kavita also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Nija, so for taking our invitation and such an excellent and inspiring talk. Uh, as Dr. Sujata has said, and Dr. Maninder also, the need is for every gynecologist to screen and uh, prevent the cervical cancer. So everybody should join hands and take this forward. Thank you, Dr. Nija, ma'am, for your excellent talk. Thank you so much. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the next session. I would like to invite the chairpersons for the next session. Is my screen visible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, chairperson for the next session is Dr. Parneet Kaur. She is a DGO MD FICOG professor, Department of OB Gaini at GMC Patiala. She has a teaching experience of 16 years. She has been an examiner for undergraduates and postgraduates for the last 10 years. She has 45 publications in various national and international journals. She has contributed three chapters in books and a reviewer for two reputed speci speciality journals. She is currently the president of NABA Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. Her special interests are high-risk pregnancy and contraception. 
She's a master trainer for postpartum IUCD, member of Foxy, ICOG, IMS, IH, PCO Society, NARCHI, SFM, and other organizations. So I welcome Dr. Parneet Kaur as the chairperson. The second chairperson is Dr. Vedu Morgil. She is from Ludhiana. She's the president of Ludhiana Orbs and Gaini Society, MD consultant, a director from uh, Soman Hospital and New Life Infertility and Research Center. She has many awards. She was the best student gold medal in surgery, Nari Shakti Award, In My City Award for Women Empowerment, has participated in many national and international conferences, presented at many national conferences as well. She's working as a fertility expert for the last 20 years in New Life Infertility Center, obstetrician and gynecologist at Soman Hospital, and special interest is infertility in high-risk obstetrics. So I welcome both the chairpersons and over to you. Thank you, Dr. Kavita. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are, Dr. Parni. Thank you, Dr. Kavita, for making me part of this August group. I'm here to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Anita Sabarwal. She has many titles to her credit. She is Foxy Champion, Wonder Foxian, and Foxy Superstar. She's chairperson of the Public Awareness Committee of Indian Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. And she is Secretary Forum of Obstetrician and Gynecologist of South Delhi. And she is past chairperson of Adolescent Health Committee. She has organized more than 400 updating programs, conferences, CMEs, and numerous preventive health camps community talks, public health awareness talks, including talk on cervical cancer awareness and prevention. Uh, I invite Dr. Anita Sabarwal to deliver her talk on cervical cancer screening methods. Dr. Anita Sabarwal, please. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Praneet. Thank you so much for the kind words. It's indeed an honor to be here today, especially you know at my alma mater, where you know I read, I learned everything from the CNC, and the chief guest being my own teacher, Dr. Lakbir Ma'am. We learned from her, you know, and today we are here. And since I've been given a topic on this prevention of cervical cancer, especially by screening, you know, we have been imbibed so much about prevention right from our first year of MBBS. I remember in Ludhiana, we used to go to Field Ganj, Jamalpur, that Laltokala village, the Naringwal village, where all these places, we imbibe so much of prevention. And I am basically a person who's working at a grassroots level and all the time into prevention. So uh, I will try to do the best because I have been sandwiched between two great stars, the icons of Ox and Gaini, you know. Dr. Nija Bhatla and Dr. Sarita Sham Sundar. But I'm at the same time really honored having been given the same platform. So I'll try to do justice to the talk which has been given to me. Uh, I shall just like to share my screen. So, uh, yes. I'll just do it and Is that visible? My slides are visible? Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, it is visible. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So I can do the slide share. Shall I? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Uh, Nija Bhatla has already done the job very easy for me because she's already given the substance of the whole talk, basically. So I think my slides we are going to go through, we are rather going to revise so that we can imbibe more of whatever she told us. And ultimately, we are able to practice and give it to the community. So I start because some of the slides are going to be repetitive, as I think she has already gone through because cervical cancer is really uh, a big global health problem. So that is why we are talking about Globocon 2020 India fact. And she has already told us about the breast cancer and then the cancer of cervix. 
and now in 2020 what happened actually cervical cancer was the seventh most common cancer in the world and the fourth most common cancer among dr, dr. anita please put your uh, slides in the slideshow mode slideshow yeah okay. i'm not in the slideshow no yes now yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sarita. Thank you so much. So, and the fourth most cancer, uh, common cancer among women in 2020. So, that is the reason. Now, again, in this slide, you can see more than you know 600,000 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer, and more than 340,000 deaths were caused by the cervical cancer in 2020. So, how much prevalent it is? and such a major public health problem. So that is why on 19th May, 2018, as even Dr. Bartla was telling us, the WHO Director General Tedros, he makes a global call for action towards the elimination of cervical cancer. Because he said it's simply no longer acceptable that any woman should die from a disease, which is very, very much preventable as well as treatable. And we have all the tools we need to consign cervical cancer to the history books. And that is those four tools of vaccination, screening, treatment, and palliative care. So the challenge is to ensure that all girls globally, they are vaccinated against HPV. And the woman, every woman over the age of 30, she should be screened and treated for the precancerous lesions so that we uh, get rid of this cervical cancer. And 194 countries resolved to end the suffering of women. And as she just mentioned, 17 November 2020, global strategy launched. We were also part of it uh, in uh, when Dr. Alpesh Gandhi Foxy uh, took part in it. And there was a launch of the global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer. As Dr. Bartla very rightly said, it's not eradication like smallpox, but elimination of the cervical cancer. So as she just said, she mentioned also, she actually said 90%, 70%, 90%, because the plan towards elimination is 2020 to 30. And the vision is a world without cervical cancer. And the goal is below four cases of cervical cancer per 100,000 women years. And the targets are that 90% of girls should be fully vaccinated before they attain the age of 15 years by HPV vaccine. And 70% of the women who are sexually exposed, they should be screened with an HPV test at the age of 35 and 45 years. And then out of these, 90% should be managed appropriately. And so there are ultimately 30% reduction in mortality from cervical cancer. So this slide is again, I'm repeating. And the life course approach to cervical cancer prevention and control, because everything has to go together, then only we can achieve these targets. So why? Because primary prevention can happen only with the HPV vaccine. And then secondary prevention by screening and tertiary prevention when we do the treatment and palliative care. So primary prevention can happen between the age of 19, nine years to 15 years, especially when we give vaccination to our girls. And girls and boys is appropriate health information, awareness, and warnings about tobacco use, sexuality education, tailored as per age and culture, condom promotion, provision for those engaged in sexual activity and male circumcision, the, all the knowledge should be imparted. And secondary prevention for the women who are sexually active, more than 30 years of age, the, again, the same policy, screen and treat, single visit approach. And, and it is very easy to follow. Point of care, rapid HPV testing for high risk HPV types, followed by immediate treatment, on-site treatment, so that we don't lose the patients. And tertiary prevention, as already mentioned, treatment of invasive cancer at any age and palliative care by ablative surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and palliative care. And these are the global guidelines, global indicators, and global cost-effective recommendations. Now, the cause of cervical cancer, as we all know, human papilloma virus. Now, this virus, when there is persistent infection with this virus, along with other factors like more childbirths, multiple sexual partners, early age at first sex, 
early age at first childbirth, low socioeconomic status, sexually transmitted diseases, smoking, and contraceptive pills if used continuously without a gap of more than five years. They all add to this. Now, why there's major reasons for high mortality? Because again, as we mentioned, like so for we have this pap smear screening for the last so many years, but still lack of organized screening program, late diagnosis in advanced stage. So we are still having high mortality because of cervical cancer. So now prevention, this is a deadly disease, but very, very much preventable disease and which we can easily do with vaccination as well as screening. So vaccination and screening, they go together. As Dr. Vija Bhatla just mentioned, uh, at the moment we have, we are using two vaccines, bivalent and quadrivalent. And uh, the basic uh, idea is because I am into awareness. So we like to go and aware everyone in the community, whether we go to schools, colleges, everywhere, we must explain to them that their girl child from the age of nine years can be vaccinated. So if they vaccinate them between the age of nine to 15, there is maximum benefit and only two doses are required. And after the age of 15, up to the age of 25, three doses are required. Though we have a license for up to the age of 45 years, but earlier the better, the more impact it has. Now we ultimately come to cervical screening. So the prevention could be done in the earlier part. And on the cervical screening, why we should do it? Because this is one of the few cancers which is very, very easily preventable. Because the changes can be spotted and treated 10 to 15 years before the development of cancer. So by screening, we are able to spot the precancerous lesions and we have a long window period of 10 to 15 years for the cancer to develop. So the screening can really help us uh, eliminate this cancer. And then developed countries, it was found where this with screening program, women who did not go for cervical screening, they developed cervical cancer. Whereas the women who went for screening program, they did not develop cervical cancer. So now there are various screening tests. Uh, Dr. Bartler has already told us about all the uh, screening tests for cervical cancer. So we have different screening tests like HPV tests that detects the human papilloma virus infection. So these are called all HPV tests. Then we have tests which detect the disease. That is the precancerous lesions of cervical cancer, which we are aiming at. So this is the PAP test, which very nicely she told us about, uh, I think it was, uh, it came in uh, 1976. And then we have VIA and we have VILI test. So as we can see here, when we have normal cervix initially, and then there is because of sexual exposure, the human papilloma virus infection invades the cervix and mostly it gets cleared on its own, but at times when it is not cleared and it is persisting. So persistence of infection can lead to uh, dysplasia of the cervical tissue. And that is a precancerous lesion and ultimately it leads to cancer of cervix. So that is the time when there is persistent of infection and we are able to do these cervical cancer screenings. So you can see here in this slide that before it goes on to developing cancer, if we do in the earlier part when this infection is persistent, then pap smear or HPV DNA test or VIA and VILI test, these are the cervical cancer screening tests which can be done. So now screening guidelines as per the FOXI GCPR, that is good clinical uh, practice recommendations. As you can see, we have because uh, India, we have you know, different resources. Some areas we have limited resources. In certain areas, we have good resources. So as per the resources, we can have good resources. We can have HPV testing, primary HPV testing, co-testing, that is both HPV and cytology or only cytology and in limited resources, as it was just mentioned earlier, VIA seems to be a good option. And then the target age group uh, is 25 to 65 for HPV and for VIA it is 30 to 65. But as we just mentioned in postmenopausal with VIA, the, it may not be so effective because of again that the junction is not visible. 
and the frequency is that primary hpv testing or core testing can be done every 5 years and cytology should be done that is pap smear every 3 years mm -hmm. and again the via is every 5 years at least one to three times in a lifetime or maybe as uh, dr nija bhatla mentioned twice also if we do at the age of 35 and 45 it would suffice so uh, as we just said different cervical screening methods so pap smear in women from the age of 25 to 65 years every 3 years they should be repeated via which is the visual inspection of cervix after applying acetic acid could be done preferably uh, in 30 to 45 years of age premenopausal and again this can be done 5 years now hpv test is done between the age of 30 to 65 years 5 mm -hmm. yearly and then we have the option of pap plus hpv together co test with in the age group of 30 to 65 years again every 5 years now we come to very simple visual methods that is the visual inspection with acetic acid or via test and this is done with the naked eye so we don't need any instrument to see the cervix this is also called cervicoscopy and second one is visual inspection after applying lugol's iodine so it's called villi and this is also known as chiller's test so how do we do it i'll just tell you in this slides we need 5% acetic acid to apply on the uh, cervix and so that you can make from 5 ml of glacial acetic acid you take 5 ml glacial acetic acid and 95 ml of distilled water and you mix it and freshly prepared this solution only should be used and after using this should be discarded so every time you use you have to the next day you have to make a fresh solution and we explain to patients vinegar vinegar it's like vinegar and it hardly uh, gives any problem or irritation to the patient and we dr sarita sham sundar our next speaker is there who is the president of iscp also uh, we have conducted camps at various places including one once even in my clinic also and we could do 50 patients in a go we could do the via and we could even manage them so and it is very very easy only thing is you have to first you know you have to inform them counsel them and once they really understand the whole thing they are very cooperative and this test can be done very very easily because it's a painless test and just few minutes job so the uh, basic uh, basics of this test is that abnormal cells uh, uh, in the cervical tissue they will be having increased nucleus cytoplasmic ratio and now this protein because of the more uh, nucleus cytoplasmic ratio it will coagulate on the application of this 5% acetic acid and when this coagulation happens this is seen as acetovite areas to naked eye and so normal epithelium does not show these changes so once you see uh, these uh, these changes we know this is via positive but via positive is also seen in immature squamous metaplasia also in inflamed or regenerating cervical epithelium so that we must rule out so you can see again we were talking about the speculum examination and this cusco examination is very very easy once one gets used to it's so easy you are able to uh, ma manipulate so well and you are able to see the whole cervix so well and uh, this is you know you uh, see the patient in modified lithotomy position you have to inspect the genitalia insert the cusco speculum and visualize the cervix and you can clean the mucus and after that you apply 5% acetic acid with a swab stick and then you keep it applied for 1 minute and then after 1 minute you remove it and you observe using the naked eyes under a good light so there should be a good back light and then you are able to see any lesions over there identify the squamocolor junction as because you can see the junction of pink squamous and red columnar epithelium you can see the arrow is showing this is the junction now how will you interpret the via test via negative is when you will see no acetovite lesions number one or you will see some faint acetovite lesions because of polyp or cervicitis or inflammation or nebothium cyst 
they also look like s to white apparels but they will be a uh, prominent s uh, the squamocolonal junction now where is in positive lesions you will see sharp distinct very well defined and dense opaque dull or oyster white areas acetal white areas with or without raised margins touching the squamocolonal junctions and you can also see them in leukoplakia and warts now why are positive and invasive cancer here you will see you know very clearly visible ulcerative cauliflower like growth or ulcer and you may also see some oozing or they will be bleeding on touch now in the next slide you will be able to see in the pictures very clearly on the left you can see there is no acetal white lesion so this is via negative via negative or normal and now here this is this right side slide you can see again you can see there is atrophian we also call it cervical erosion when your inside cells they come out and grow over the squamous cell so here again this is negative uh next slide why are negative again here you can see geographic satellite lesions which are detached from the squamocolonal junction so that is why they are negative again here also you can see faint patchy acetal white thing in the anterior lip which is due to squamous metaplasia and here you can see a polyp protruding out so the faint acetal white epithelium is due to this polyp and uh, on the right side you can see acetal white areas with ill defined margins which is due to nebothian cyst and now we can see the positive slides this is via positive when when we call it positive when there are distinct well defined dense opaque or dull white or oyster white acetal white areas and they are closer to the squamous columnar junction in the transformation zone and not far away from the os so both in the left side and the right side you can see well defined opaque acetal white lesion arising from the squamous columnar junction and again here you can see the via positive results you can see thick well defined opaque acetal white areas which are abutting the junction in the anterior and posterior lip and posterior lip you can see is extending into the endocervical canal on the right again there is dense white acetal white area with raised and rolled out margins around the external os involving all the four quadrants of the cervix and here you can see on the left the uh, acetal white area which is very dense all over the cervix involving all four quadrants and extending into the cervical canal and over here you can even see uh, circumferentially raised dull chalky white lesion with irregular surface and several bleeding points on touch involving the cervix and this is the via positive invasive cancer so via recommendation screening method by government of india guidelines as per 2016 also you can see in the middle cervical 30 to 65 years visual inspection with acetic acid once in 5 years and if it is positive it used to be re referred to the uh, uh, the higher center for the management of this lesion now sensitivity and specificity of this via is almost 88% sensitive and 89 90% specific so this can be easily utilized because in the low income group areas now second is the spaxwear which uh, dr neeja bhatla very nicely showed that slide and uh, it has a very nice uh, history also that pepper nicolau you know he first performed his pap test on his wife who used to be really cooperative and be his subject for his experiments and this here the spaxwear is very easily it can be done again you can use a speculum or a cusco and you visualize the cervix and then you use a spatula and the, you have to just insert it into the os and protrude it 360 degree and then whatever smear comes out you spread it on a glass slide and then this uh, tissue can be fixed with spray or liquid fixative and uh, in post menopausal women sometimes it's difficult to manage so you can use cyto brush also so this i just uh, brush is shown the slide is shown and the ion spatula is shown which is always provided by the people who do this testing so again the sensitivity is 52% and specificity is 
95% with this conventional pap smear. And now we also have liquid-based cytology. And here the ectocervical samples are collected by the brush or sort of you can see it's like a broom which is rotated five full circles in clockwise fashion so that maximum amount of cells are taken up and then it is rinsed into a vial containing fixated. So as you can see here again, this is processed by centrifugation. So sedimentation and deposition is done into a thin layer of cells on a slide and the reporting is done. The advantages are because here the specimen adequacy is improved and lesser air drying artifacts are there and even distribution of cells on the slide surface. And it is less congested, so less potential for cellular debris. So the field becomes more clear. And uh, this, this is how you can see both the slides. The left is the conventional PAP and on the right side is the liquid waste cytology. But the price difference comes as we go higher and higher. Now, if you see the sensitivity, here it is 81% and specificity is 95%. And now the next one, so we talked about the uh, VIA and then we talked about now uh, this uh, pap smear, both conventional and uh, liquid-based cytology. And now we come to the HPV testing. So HPV testing is the need of the R in fact, because the, here again, the cells are taken from the cervix. In fact, when you do liquid-based cytology, that time also that can be utilized for HPV test. And otherwise, when you are just doing HPV test, the cells are taken from the cervix, transported in a medium and tested for HPV virus. And it is a very, very highly sensitive test. So Dr. Nija Bartla had very clearly depicted in all her slides. So there are different techniques. And as she said, gene expert seems to be really good. And there are more technologies coming up. So with that, HPV test can be utilized. So it's role in clinical practice. Uh, because we can, you know, sort out the ascus abnormalities on PAPs if there are, if we do HPV testing along with that. So triage for ascus abnormalities and then co-testing, also follow up after treatment, and then it can also be part of primary screening. The sensitivity of this test is 96%, whereas sensitivity of Cytology is 53%. And if you compare the specificity, then that is comparable because 92% in HPV, rather cytology has 97% specificity. So as you can see in different hybrid capture, care HPV, that the gene expert, so all these are there. And testing for HPV DNA is high neg negative predictive value. And the, therefore, it tells us that risk of cervical cancer over five to eight years is negligible. So the patient feels really good that all is well. And also now, as Dr. Nija Bartla was telling us that now self-sampling uh, of HPV test is coming up. And that is going to really do wonders in our country because so many women are unreached because of so many reasons, so many, uh, like so many factors of fear, and then uh, they are not able to reach the place. So these women can then uh, ultimately, they'll be able to uh, take self sample for the HPV because they will be provided with a kit which will contain a swab stick in a tube. And uh, also they'll be given a zipper bag. So they'll be able to insert the uh, swab stick and into the vagina high up. And then they will have to rotate it twice or thrice and take it out and put it into the tube, uh, seal it and then put it in the bag and then send it to the community person or to the lab, uh, whichever way it should be sorted out. So then I think many women will be able to be, uh, we shall be able to screen most of the women. And as per WHO, I just wanted to touch a bit about the menstrual hygiene because as almost 25% of world cervical cancer deaths happen in India and poor menstrual hygiene also seems to be the top most contributing factor. Because unhygienic handling of menstrual waste can also easily spread this HPV virus which is transmitted sexually leading to cervical cancer. 
so that also comes as part of prevention so menstrual hygiene also must be talked to the these women whenever we get the opportunity so ultimately screening is the backbone of cancer prevention cytological screening is a proven successful tool of secondary prevention for low resource settings we can utilize via or villi they should be popularized and hpv testing having high negative prediction value and longer testing intervals being implemented in many countries and so it should be done in our country so thus ultimately prevention is better than cure intellectuals solve problems but geniuses prevent them so i'm sure my all alma mater my all these people who are studying here in cmc ludhiana under the guidance of our very dear dr kavita bhatti uh, they all are going to be the geniuses who are going to prevent all these problems and true prevention is not waiting for bad things to happen it's preventing things from happening in the first place so if we go for screening as combined with vaccination we can really go a long way and to succeed in life one needs only three things and these are the three bones a wish bone a backbone and a funny bone so i think the wish which dr kavita has already generated and the backbone is we had such great speakers like dr nija bhatla and uh, uh, dr sarita sham sundar whose talk is coming up and all my teachers and my all these worthy uh, 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 chair persons who are going to add to the knowledge banks of all the learners here it's really going to help everyone and in a nice Uh, atmosphere that is funny one way so that our patients our women are not scared of us they they want to meet us they want to be screened by us so these things are going to go a long way and help us get rid of this cervical cancer from our country thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you dr anita for such a wonderful and elaborate talk on how a small uh, decision of ours to do a per speculum examination and taking a pap smear can go a long way to detect this disease and india being a developing country we still have uh, if we do a these small test which is not a burden on that much as a disease is a burden and uh, i also congratulate dr uh, kavita for this uh, cme and uh, Doctor, I also, uh, you know, take a lot of take home messages from Doctor Dhaliwal, from Doctor Neeja Batla, and definitely we can in our day to day practice we can also propagate this information to our patients, and even in our schools to tell our mothers to you know, uh, vaccinate the young girls who are not sexually active to prevent the disease as far as possible. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Anita. I have a question, if I can. Sure, uh, yeah. sure. Hello. I have uh, great uh, people with me, so ask any question. <laughs> Dr. Anita, I just wanted to ask you, what is your experience and your comments on uh, uh, dried pap smear slides, air dried pap smear slides? Are the results equal when we uh, do That's it? That's what you call it. Right. yeah it depends actually see if uh, if you have really learned well i learned well from our dr mohini nayar so once she taught us and we we learned it so problems with that all the all the results used to be super rare hai to apne apna sath rakhna apne sath pehna apne sath khana na to koi mujhe wala na tokne wala na rokne wala na munda tokke hello please hello requesting all to mute please yeah yeah please mute yourself so basically you know it depends it's all subjective if you really know it you have good training you have good experience then the results are really good but uh, it depends uh, if you have not good training then so many times we have pseudo results so that is there but lbc has come up and it's for those people also who are not very much trained they can also do it but otherwise via is the best for those people it's so easy anybody can learn it definitely dr parnita i just wanted to know whether you you, you meant uh, spraying with a fixative and then drying it or is it uh, or no no, no, no ma'am i asked about air dried uh, 
slides just a right without uh, without a fixative, fixative. yes without <clears throat> Because our pathology people ask for that only and they maybe they dehydrate it within certain period of time so they say the results are same so that was my question what is your experience okay. what do you nowadays, recommend nowadays we usually you know take that fixative solution the results are better with uh, once you fix the slide and they are OPD zone yeah so we use, use a simple any spray you can use even hair spray the same yeah, so yes. spray, only thing is as long as the material is good and you put up a spray it is good the slides are good because we never had any spills and people like dr mani once hpv is positive how long do you follow up with patient one year after one year you one okay thank you dr I stop share, na? Doctor Kavita. Uh, yes, uh, Doctor Anita. Thank you so much for such a elaborate, comprehensive, and a motivate motivating talk. Because uh, now I think everybody in CMC at least will be really motivated to screen all ladies. It has to be an opportunistic screening, and whether a patient comes for any reason, any gyne gynecological problem, she needs to be screened. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us, and uh, really grateful to you. Thank you, Doctor Kavita. But yeah, you are you back. I couldn't see you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm so happy back to my alma mater. I'm so happy. Thank you so much, ma'am. You're always welcome. Mm -hmm. So now we go on to the next session. I would like to invite the chairpersons for the next session. Is my screen, screen visible? Yes. So the chairperson for the next session is Dr. Surjit Kaur. She's MBBS, MS, FIC, MCH, laparoscopy and hysteroscopy surgeon, a colposcopist and IVF specialist. She is the director of Parivar IVF Center, Jalandhar, secretary of Isar Punjab chapter, chapter secretary of IMS Jalandhar chapter, president Jalandhar Obs and Gyni Society. She has been the past secretary of Jalandhar Obs and Gyni Society for 11 years, life member of Narchi, has organized CMEs for Isar and IMS for Jalandhar chapter, arranged camps in urban and rural areas of Jalandhar district for various infertility problems awareness of menopausal health problems. We welcome you, Dr. Surjit Kaur. Next chairperson is Dr. Rajya Devi Goel. She's MD, FICOG, NAMS, Professor and Head, Ames Matinda. She's done a training in gynae oncology in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, and also in Kidwai Memorial Cancer Center, Bangalore. She's a laparoscopic, she has done a laparoscopic training at Kochi, has many publications, more than 50 in international and national journals. Welcome, Dr. Lajja, and over to you for the next session. Hello, I'm audible? Yes, Dr. Surjit, you're audible. Distinguished guest speakers, chairpersons, and all the viewers, good afternoon, all the friends. We were so much busy with the cervical camp screenings in the last few days. Timely screening, diagnosis, and prevention is the best treatment for the cervical cancer. And prompt treatment can save the woman from up to 93%. So we have listened to last very wonderful talks about this screening programs and proper examination, how to prevent and all. See, if after all these things, if we come to know that there is a CIN, so how to treat and how to go with it and advise the patient and follow-ups. Now we are going to listen, Dr. Sarita Shamsundar. Dr. Sarita, she's MD, FRCOG, FICOG, BSCCP, accredited colposcopist. She's senior specialist and professor 
UMCC and Sabdar Jang Hospital, New Delhi. She is President, ISCCP 2018-21, Vice President, Narji Delhi Branch 2018-20. She is Member, Foxy Oncology Committee, co-authored Foxy GCRR Guidelines on Cervical Screening and Vaccination. She has authored three books, 10 chapters, more than 50 articles in national and international journals. She is secretary AICCRCOG, North June 2017, 7 to 2012, and MRCOG part two course convener for 10 years national coordinator. First, I have CPC distance learning program in colposcopy. She is a master trainer, government cancer screening program, national coordinator for Foxy Mega Screening Camp on International Women Day 2020. She is award aptaker oration by Association of Medical Women in India 2019. Now she is organizing chairperson of IFCPC 2021 World Congress. So welcome Dr. Sarita for your deliberation. Thank you so much, uh, Madam, for the kind introduction. And I thank uh, Kavita and Dr. Anita for uh, coordinating this and getting me into this uh, program. It's a pleasure to be back in with the Ludhiana Society. I remember we did a, a, a workshop two years ago in 2019, and uh, a lot of you are familiar. And I thank uh, Kavita for uh, getting everyone together, Dr. Sunita Goyal, Dr. Sujata Sharma, Dr. Parneet, Dr. Vidhu Modgil, Dr. Surjit Kaur, Dr. Lajja Goyal, and Dr. Geetanjali Kaur. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. And I know it's it's a we had a very interactive uh, CME uh, the, uh, then, and I know you know all of you in Ludhiana, you are very very uh, active and you are very committed to do for this cause of cervical cancer prevention. So I hope this uh, yeah you, you you've heard passionate talks by Dr. Nirja and Dr. Anita. I hope I am sure by now you are all motivated to take up the, the cause of uh, screening and elimination of cervical cancer by 2030. So what are the, you know, let us just, I'll just go over briefly about the treatment methods for CIN. So we know from the natural history of CIN that, uh, and we know from, uh, uh, the, the uh, studies that CIN actually the, the regression rate is around a little over 50 percent whereas it persists in uh, one third of them and it progresses to CIN3 in 11 percent and it can progress to invasive cancer in one percent and with CIN2 the, the regression the numbers who reg which regress are much less and uh, persistence persistence and progression is higher and in CIN3 is uh, the, the again the raised rate of persistence and progression is much higher and the progression to invasive cancer is 12 percent so in the, although the mean interval of progression is 10 to 20 years, but it can take uh, as short as one and a half to two years also, especially with HPV 16 and 18, because these infections can be uh, quite virulent. So what is the rationale of treatment? How do we decide you know, how to treat uh, these uh, patients? The, now, if you look at the normal cervix, you know, the, this is the coronal section of the normal cervix, and you can see that this is the squamous epithelium here, and you have the uh, endocervix has the epithelium in, uh, in these crypts. So it is columnar epithelium, but it is going into the crypts. And it is the CIN, CIN is not only on the surface, but it can also go into the crypts. So this dark area shows CIN involving the crypts. So 
and how much does it go deep into the crypts? So there was actually a, a study actually in Samaritan Hospital for Women in London, where they actually reviewed all the cone biopsies. They had 343 cone biopsies reviewed histologically and measurements were made of the deepest script in each specimen that they had of the coneization. So they, they, they looked at how much, how deep is the CIN going into the crypt. And they found that destruction or the, the mean depth of crypts. So if you destroy, if destruction of tissue to a depth of 2.92 millimeters would eradicate all the involved crypts in 95% of patients. Whereas if you go a little deeper, that's to 3.8 millimeters, it would eradicate 99.7% of CINs. So that is the basis of uh, the treatment methods that have evolved. And the other beauty of the CIN lesions uh, is they're mostly in the transformation zone. That is, they're mostly on the cervix, the ectocervix. You can see them. The average linear extent is 7.5 millimeters, which is less than a centimeter. And vaginal extension is seen in less than 5% of cases. So most of the lesions are right there on the cervix and they're easily treatable. So how do we decide what are the principles of treatment? So when you're treating CIN, the treat treatment has to be effective. That means it has to eradicate the entire transformation zone. And it's not just the lesion, but it should take care of the entire transformation zone. And it should be safe with minimum risk of complications. So when you counsel uh, women who have uh, CIN, we have to make them understand why treatment is needed and what are the risks of no treatment, the safety of the procedure, and the need for regular follow-up even after treatment. And uh, mind you, I mean, we, uh, we find that a lot of women actually are ready to take up treatment, even if it's a single visit approach. Uh, and so it is the single visit approaches are definitely practical and they can be, uh, they are acceptable. And this has been proved in many studies which are done, done by the WHO. So it's, I think it's just a, a thought block that patients do not accept and the risk there is a lot of over treatment, but studies have shown that the, the risk of even our experience shows that the risk of overtreatment is is less. Then how do you choose the right treatment? So how, how you treat would depend on what is the age of the patient. So in a younger uh, patient, you would go for a more ablative uh, approach. Uh, a woman who is Paris, you would go for you would consider an excisional method. The fertility aspirations, if the woman is planning a, a pregnancy, then you would either wait, you know, for follow-up uh, on, on uh, you would either just observe or you can go for ablative methods. And any previous treatment, if she's had previous treatment by ablation, then she will go for excision. And how compliant is the patient? So if the woman is non-compliant, you would definitely go for treatment rather than observation. And I, and I see, you know, practically, I we find that personally, you know, the experience of uh, follow-up, we find that even women who are who's, who are educated, also, and they had, we had, did leave some uh, women on follow-up, but then they do not come. So I, uh, I, as a policy, I just, I offer treatment to every patient, whether they accept it or not, that is, uh, and most of them actually accept the treatment and if even if it's a, a, a lady who's wanting you know it's a fertility is an issue and you find that even ablative methods do not affect fertility and even in women with uh, who are pl planning a pregnancy later can be offered ablation and uh, you know treatment for cervical cancer so these pre-invasive lesions is more important. So it's actually cancer prevention is a, a very important uh, uh, you know a a thing we, we have to think about the because cancer is something which, which is can be prevented by the treatment. So let us uh, look at what are the different approaches that can be used. So the single visit approach, which is what Dr. Nija was talking about. So there are two different approaches. One is the screen and treat and see and treat. So screen and treat is you screen with a VIA and you treat 
at the same time with or without biopsy, then there is a low probability of overtreatment in high prevalence area. So since our country is a high prevalence area, this is, this is very, very practical. And the only drawback is uh, if, uh, if a biopsy has not been taken, but if you take a biopsy and you can treat at the same time. So at the same setting, biopsy and treatment is possible. Whereas C and treat is involves colposcopy. If the patient is, if the woman is referred for colposcopy and with an abnormal cytology uh, report and on colposcopy, you find a high grade lesion and you can treat at the same time by either excision or ablation. Again, there's a loop or probability of overtreatment because you know by the cytology report that it is, uh, it is an abnormal smear and it has high grade abnormality. And by uh, excision, if you're using an excisional method, it, you can even uh, analyze the biopsy report, the excision specimen, and they correlate with the histopathology. So this is these are the WHO guidelines which are brought out for screening and treatment of precancerous lesions in 2013, that if you do not have a screening, if you do have a screening program in place, so the, the a lot of developed countries use cytology for screening, so then they can carry on. But if you do not have, if, if you have a HPV available, if you have the resources for HPV test, uh, for screening, then HPV test, testing should be used. But if we do not have the resources for an HPV test, then VI, that is VI alone, can be used for screening and followed by cryotherapy or LEAP as a, as a part of the screen entry program. And this is what uh, has been incorporated in the operational framework guidelines of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Nija was talking about. And this was, uh, this is the flow chart. With the, if the woman, the woman is VIA positive, so either the, if the lesion is eligible for cryotherapy, then cryotherapy should be carried out at the same time. And But if they're not eligible for cryotherapy, uh, then they had, could they should be sent for colposcopy and and a biopsy either the naked eye the biopsy can be also can either be colposcopy guided or even the naked eye biopsy can be taken and if the, the if it is a low grade ci then go for cryotherapy but if it's high grade then go for uh, excisional method that is sleep so this is uh, on the uh, in 2019, the WHO incorporated thermal ablation as a part of the screen and treatment policy. Again, which is a very simple method for treatment of CIN. Whereas the, the, if they are not eligible for ablative treatment, they go for lips. Can I request uh, everybody to just please mute themselves? So let us first uh, see how we decide the eligibility for treatment and what exactly is this transformation zone. So if you look at the, uh, the cervix, uh, even with the naked eye or with the colposcope, this is how you see the squamocolumnar junction. So this is the squamous epithelium. This is the multi-layered squamous epithelium and the single layered columnar epithelium. And the junction between the, the pink and the red epithelium is the squamocolumnar junction. Again, very easy to detect and very easy to identify. So if you're able, and the formation, how is the transformation zone formed? Again, it's a, essential for us to understand the treatment methods. So if the from birth to menarche, because we don't, there is not much estrogen. So the columnar epithelium is coming out and it's on the ectocervix. Whereas with at menarche, you have the lot of estrogens. So the estrogen, which the squamous epithelium is very sensitive to the effect of estrogen. And there is proliferation of the squamous epithelium and it goes and covers the columnar epithelium. And you have, uh, so that is a process of metaplasia and the squamous columnar junction actually shifts inwards. And that is the new squamous columnar junction. And the reverse happens uh, in the post peri and post menopause, again the squamous columnar junction is going to shift inwards uh, further. So the uh, the part between the old and the new squamous columnar junction is your transformation zone, which you need to identify. So the commonly what uh, what you see the the square the line that you see uh, clearly is the squamous that the squamous columnar junction is the new squamous columnar junction and the old squamous columnar junction is actually just an imaginary line outside uh, where it is beyond the uh, last crypt 
So this, when you're able to see the schema columnar junction easily without any manipulation, this is a type one transformation zone. But if you need some manipulation to visualize the schema columnar junction, then it is a type two uh, transformation zone. As you can see here, so you can see here you have these acetovite lesions, but you can't see the squamous columnar junction. So, but if you use, so here again you can see these acetovite lesions, but you can't see the upper limit where it is going. But if you use uh, the endocervical speculum, the with manipulation, you can see the junction of the squamous and the columnar epithelium. So this is a type two transformation zone. Whereas the type three transformation zone, when you cannot visualize the squamous columnar junction with any manipulation, that is a type three transformation zone, which you can see here, you can see these acetovite lesions, but you can't see the squamous columnar junction. Even with manipulation, you cannot identify the squamous columnar junction. So that is a type three transformation zone. So so you have these again depicted diagrammatically. So you have a lesion here right on the uh, ectocervix, which you can see uh, that, that is a type one transformation zone. A type two is when it is going slightly inside, but can be uh, visualized with manipulation. And this is when it's going deep inside. So if it's a type one or a type two transformation zone, the method of treatment, you can treat them by ablation. Whereas if it's a type three transformation zone, you're, you know, your ablation, because it's going to be applied only to this uh, surface uh, epithelium. It's, it, you cannot go in with, uh, with your, the ablative method. So for that, you need excision. So the tree is screen and treat uh, with, that is a single visit approach. So we, who are the uh, patients who are eligible? So they are either VIA or HPV positive. When you can see the squamous columnar junction is fully visible and the lesion is ectocervical only and it's not occupying more than 75% of the cervix and can be covered by the la largest cryoprobe. So if you can, you should be able to cover the lesion with a cryoprobe if your cryotherapy is used. So the principle of cryotherapy, you all know it's a, basically it's a gas, which is nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide at very low temperatures at minus 89 to minus and minus 68 degrees centigrade. And it's basically the cells undergo cryonecrosis and rapid intracellular crystallization. There is thermal shock, protein denaturation and vascular stasis. That's how it causes cell death. And even with the cryotherapy, you can achieve a target, target depth of necrosis of 4.8 millimeters and which can treat 99% of CIN lesions. So this is uh, basically just a... Okay, this is just an animated animation, but it's okay. So this is how the cryotherapy procedure is uh, done. It's basically just a applying that there is a you need that cylinder and the cryoprobe. And uh, you just need to activate that and you you find the ice ball forming. And once the ice ball forms, you have to wait for three minutes. So it is three minutes freeze, five minutes thaw and three minutes uh, refreeze. So it's a double freeze technique, which improves reliability and has a lower residual disease rate. Well, coming to thermal ablation, uh, with, which is recently been introduced with, uh, in by the WHO, although it has, was available for many years. It is basically, it was called cold coagulation in, initially, which was a misnomer, but it is actually heat coagulation. It's coagulation uh, by heat, and it is a thermal uh, thermocoagulator. This is the generator, and this is a metallic probe, which is heated by electricity. So you're, you're destroying the epithelium by heat. And the depth of destruction is very quick. You can achieve a, a destruction of more than four millimeters in less than a minute. So that is the effectiveness of this uh, technique. So this is how, this is a short video which this, just shows the procedure. trying to actually just fast forward it.
yeah so the heated you with the the metallic the the generator with the generator you actually uh, put it on activate it and you apply the activated probe on the uh, the cervix you identify the lesion first with, with uh, by applying lugol's iodine and you just wait for 40 seconds you apply it on the cervix on the lesion and just wait for 40 seconds and you don't need to Uh, wait for it to thaw. So with the cryotherapy, you need to wait for the ice ball to thaw to actually melt and then come out. But with this, you don't need uh, to wait, and uh, you can actually reapply at another point. So if the lesion is big, you can do up to five applications. So you, if the uh, you can apply at one point and then you can reapply the next uh, area. So you can cover the entire lesion with this method, and the it. that's how the cervix looks after the treatment so the cold coagulator although we uh, the who has reintroduced it but it has actually been used for many years it has been used in europe uk and south america and it was uh, called the sem cold coagulator and a meta analysis of uh, more than 10000 patients and uh, including low middle income countries has shown that the response rate for biopsy proven ci and 2 plus is high grade ci and is 93.8% and it's effective across a variety of settings and the who in 2019 brought uh, brought out guidelines for the use of the uh, thermal ablation and even not even, not only in screen and treat but even in women who have histologically confirmed uh, CI and two or three, if they are eligible for ablative treatment, so thermal ablation can be considered. Whereas if they are not eligible for ablation, then let's they sh uh, should be performed or leap, uh, which is large loop excision of the transformation zone. So let's is the term that is now recommended by the WHO. So in exceptional conditions where it is not let's is not available, uh, then the patient can be referred to higher center for cone biopsy. so these are the handheld uh, devices so, so now we you have a variety of devices for thermal ablation this is the vice up is the company it's this uh, the, uh, the the what i showed you was a generator a table top generator which is connected to power whereas here you you also they also have a handheld uh, device which can be which has a battery and you can Uh, basically this is the it can be connected with the power uh, like a power bank and you can use it you can take it anywhere and it also has a light where you can see while you are treating you can see the lesion and uh, it also has a slider so that you can the vagina is protected while you are introducing and it is uh, safe and then only while you are treating then the slider can be slid slid back and this is again another company uh, that that is liga which is a us based company uh, again the, they also have a thermal ablation device which can literally be packed in a little suitcase again this is battery operated and this is uh, portable and the the, the battery is uh, inserted here and the probes can be disconnected and sterilized in sidex and the device heats up in 8 seconds so that is the liger thermocoagulator and it comes you know, two probes are provided one is the flat and one which has a nipple now coming to the excisional methods if they uh, the the lesion is not eligible for ablation then you can go for excision the, the advantage is the entire transformation zone can be excised and histopathology of the entire specimen is possible you can also rule out cancer and complete excision can be confirmed and glandular disease can be detected so the instruments or uh, the you know these are the ones which are easily available it is the insulated speculum which uh, has an outlet it should have an outlet for the gas or the uh, for the smoke actually so if you do not have this outlet for smoke then your vision will be totally clouded by the fumes so in the, all the fumes get collected in the vagina and you will not be able to see anything so it's essential to have a, a speculum with an outlet for the fumes so even if you don't have an insulated speculum you can use uh, a cascos with a, a and put a condom or a glove finger on it to protect the vagina and then you need uh, lugol's iodine and you need the 
the loops. Now, if you have a dental syringe, then it is it is really good because it has these uh, cartridges which has a lignocaine and adrenaline, and it has a needle which can can easily pierce the cervix. Otherwise, the cervix is quite tough and it's difficult to pierce. Or you can use a spinal needle. So these are the best loops which are made up, which are 0.2 millimeter diameter made up either tungsten or steel. Uh, you, they come in different sizes. So the sizes which are commonly used are the medium and the large. So this uh, video is uh, shows briefly about the procedure. So you can, uh, you can select the, basically the loop which uh, uh, depending on the size of the lesion, if it's a small lesion, then go for a medium size. But if the lesion is big, then you can go for a, the large size loop. And this is the spinal needle. If you don't have the dental syringe, you can go for the spinal needle with a syringe. And this is the insulated uh, speculum with an outlet for the smoke. And this is uh, the procedure. So you uh, identify, uh, you visualize the cervix uh, uh, nicely and you apply Lugol's iodine. If you can do it under colposcopic uh, guidance, uh, otherwise you can even do it with the naked eye, but with a good light, then identify uh, the, the lesion, you mark it out with Lugol's iodine, then give intracervical lignocaine with adrenaline, that, that actually helps in decreasing the blood loss and it also gives anesthesia. There's local analgesia, so the patient does not feel the pain of the procedure. And then you activate the loop, the, the cautery, and then you, you, yeah, you take it into the substance of the cervix and then take it across gradually. You should not be too fast or too slow because otherwise you can get stuck in between. And if you get stuck, you cannot take a complete loop. And that's the uh, loop which is cone which is ready to take out. So that's the crater which you see. And uh, you have to, you just need hemostasis now. And with the ball cautery, you can just coagulate the base. And you need, uh, as I said, you need good suction throughout. So you just coagulate the base and the patient, you can just send the patient home the same uh, day, just in, the, in one or two hours, you can keep them for observation and then you can just send them home. And if you give intracervical uh, lignocaine and adrenaline, again, the bleeding is uh, much less and uh, you, you will not uh, need to do any additional procedures. And that's how the cervix looks, the crater looks after completion of uh, the treatment. So, so you can see that both these methods are really simple and simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So you don't need, you know, you don't need to learn robotic surgery. These, you just lean, learn these simple methods and you can do a lot of service to women. So in summary, CIN of, uh, of grade, first of all, assess what is the grade of CIN and what is the type of the transformation zone. If it is CIN one, I think option is either observe for two years if compliant, but if they are not, if you cannot, uh, if it's persistent and if it's, she's not compliant, then she, you can treat by ablation. Whereas if it is CIN two or CIN three, and if it is a transformation zone one and or two, then you can go for ablation. Whereas it's, if it's a transformation zone three, then go for excision. So these are uh, basically a very good article by Dr. Partha Basu on management algorithms for cervical cancer screening for resource limited uh, settings. So they, what uh, on the left side, it is a basically, you see this four visit approach, which is, uh, in, in high resource settings and in generally in Western countries, or you know, if you're practicing in a high resource uh, setting, you can do that. But what we are, the options that we have are low resource and uh, are the immediate screening and treatment by immediate ablation and leap if not suitable for ablation or go for C and treat, which is evaluate by that uh, by colposcopy and then immediate treatment or biopsy followed by treatment. So that becomes a three visit approach. So a single visit or a two visit approaches are very practical, acceptable, and there is very little over treatment rate. So in conclusion, these single visit approaches are very practical, acceptable, and they minimize the loss to follow up. And you have these different various methods, you know, you can actually the portable colposcopes uh, and the portable treatment devices where you can actually literally uh, do this treatment in your clinics, in your OPD. You don't need a separate colposcopy clinic. You can literally do it in your uh, OPDs. 
So I think all of us, 38,000 gynecologists can actually prevent this, uh, this be con being converted into this, the, the uh, cancerous stage. So a, sim a treat, uh, something which can easily treated should not be, we should not allow to, it to be progressed to this stage where nothing can be done. So I, with this, I invite you for the IFCPC 2021 World Congress, which is going to be held virtually from 1st to 5th July 2021. It was planned in 2020, but because of the pandemic, we had to postpone it. This is the 17th World Congress of the International Federation of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, a federation of 42 member countries across the world. And the theme is eliminating cervical cancer, the call for action. So there are going to be many sessions and many uh, discussions on these, when bringing, on how to strat strategize this uh, cervical cancer elimination. You can uh, submit your abstracts till 15th. So you still have two days to submit an abstract and the, all the abstracts, the best of the three. Dr. Cedric, can you please mute yourself? The best 300 abstracts will also be published in an index journal, so if, which is a supplement to the, uh, which is going to be brought out exclusively for the World Congress. So thank you once again for your patient hearing. Dr. Lajja, are you there, please? Thank you, Dr. Sarita. For the presentation on treatment of I think this is cancer. By giving this... Your voice is not clear, Dr. Lajja. I think connect connectivity is yes. not very yes. good. Thank you, Dr. Sarita, for such an elaborate uh, discussion <laughs> on treatment of CIN and such illustrative videos that you have shown us and the basic elementary things that we need to do, see and treat and the portable colposcope and a uh, very wonderful uh, talk on treatment of CIN. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for accepting our uh, invitation to join us and sparing your time on a Saturday afternoon, especially. <laughs> thank it's you so pleasure. much. It's my pleasure, Kavita. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarita, a wonderful explanation. Thank you. Very nicely you presented the uh, steps for uh, CIN management. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma cost of, okay, there's a question on cost yeah, of yeah. uh, Liger thermal ablator. Yeah, I can I can share the number of the Liger the dealer and they, you can discuss the cost uh, with them. So there are uh, two dealers uh, dealing with the Liger uh, thermal ablator in India. If any more questions, there are uh, there are no more questions in the chat box. Yeah. I would like yeah. to introduce Dr. Gitanjali Kaur, and uh, she's a MBBS MD from PGI, gold medalist, working at PAL Hospital Ludhiana, senior vice president of Ludhiana Obs and Gyne Society, treasurer SFM Ludhiana chapter, and executive member of IMS Ludhiana chapter. Her area of interest is laparoscopic and hysteroscopic surgery, high risk obstetrics, infertility, and ultrasound. So Dr. Gitanjali is here to give the concluding remarks and also a vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Tavita for this hugely successful uh, CME. There were almost 100, more than 100 delegates logged on at one time. All the speakers gave very crystal clear and crisp messages. And uh, yes, with, uh, with this, with good clear knowledge, we will inch to our, our goal of elimination of cervical cancer as elaborated by WHO. 
and uh, yes c and tree treat and screen and tree these are two important messages that we have need to have within our clinic vin and willy can easily be done by all of us if we keep uh, acetic acid and ubers iodine in our clinic and the screen and treat method where we do uh, does not even require a colposcopy so it can be in, uh, incorporated in on public health programs for all of us and again i would like to thank our chief guest dr lakshmi thaliwal ma'am and our eminent speakers dr mirja bhatla dr anita sabarwal and dr sarita shamsundar for sparing their valuable time and all the uh, guests who were uh, chair persons and yes we again dr kavita for organizing a wonderful scene thanks one and all, also i would like to thank our attendees who made this a very successful event are there any questions dr gitanjali i i had looked earlier there was just somebody wanted to know the cost and madam has shared the number of the person it's already there in the chat box um mm -hmm. uh, there is somebody has asked is are there any figures on reduction in number in the percentage of unnecessary hysterectomy if leap procedures are performed in our country how often is leap procedures performed and is there any study that how the leap has avoided unnecessary hysterectomies in our country ma'am can you would you like to talk on it ma'am would you like to elaborate on it has any studies been done that how uh, doing a leap procedure by doing a leap procedure we can uh, cut down on the hysterectomy numbers uh, anybody can take the question I don't know if there's there's been a study like that because uh, the number of uh, people doing leap uh, compared to the number of the people doing hysterectomies, I think uh, there are there are many more doing hysterectomies than the number who are doing leap. So uh, it's it's difficult to say right now because. uh you know you know most of the trainings the uh, the ma the training for in the postgraduate training hysterectomy is definitely taught you know the every postgraduate has to do at least 5 to 6 hysterectomies but then every postgraduate is not taught how to do a leap which i think is an essential uh, which is more essential uh, than doing a hysterectomy and i think this is something which you know all of you are hods at various medical colleges so i think this is something which every uh, you, you we must ensure all the postgraduates are uh, no each and every postgraduate knows the technique of ablation uh, and uh, excision that is a leap so i think that would definitely would help uh, the, the most of the time i think the the why they are not confident in doing leap is because they are they are not they have not done it before so i can i see that hesitation when uh, the doctors come to us for training they are, they think that it's easier to do a hysterectomy than do a leap uh, i would also like to ask dr neeja about the serva she talked she talked about a portal colposcope and thermal ablator are they available freely and uh, again what is the cost if you want somebody wants she talked about serva the portable colposcope and oh, with the yes. thermal ablator yeah and that uh, that they are still developing it's not yet available in the market but the thermal ablators that i spoke about and uh, yeah, the portable colposcope which is the eva is available and smart scope uh, which is by, marketed by periwinkle technology so both of them are available in the market uh, and uh, for th uh, thermal ablation it is liger or the visap so both of them are available in the market thank you so if there are no more questions then i would like to thank from my side my chief guest dr lakbi dhariwal the speakers dr neeja bhatla dr anita sabarwal dr sarita sham sundar and all the chair persons the seniors and uh, friends who attended the cme and made it possible and i would also like to thank my resident who's been sitting very quietly next to me because she has been the technical person helping me out throughout the cme in spite of a night labor room duty so with that we come to a very informative session and uh, just a last slide which i have put so no woman should die of cancer early diagnosis saves lives it can be prevented we have to be aware and make 
are patients aware of the warning signs of cervical cancer, which should not be ignored. And uh, we have to spread the word. Knowing the symptoms of cervical cancer would save many lives. When this is from the Director General WHO, when we have all the weapons at hand, then failure should not be an option when it comes to cervical cancer elimination. So let's do it jointly. Thank you once again for joining the CME, virtual CME from the Department of ob and uh, from my team in the faculty and the residents who were in my uh, department, a very big thank you to all who joined the CME on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Kavita. Thank you, CMC and Ludhiana ob Society for a good job. Good job. Wishing you, you all so a much, very good. I was waiting for your comments, ma'am, Dr. Lakhbir, ma'am. I was wondering, uh, you were not visible. <laughs> no, no, I, I was uh, listening to the talks. Okay, ma'am, thank, uh, thank you. Dr. Thank you. Sarita, do, uh, there was one Magni visualizer developed by ICPO, ICMR Wing. Uh, <laughs> any use being done anywhere? It's not available commercially, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we actually looked, uh, we tried a lot to, to get it, but it's, it was not available. Uh, the uh, the uh, other uh, disadvantage is quite bulky because of the, the big battery oh, okay. uh, for it to be carried. Mm -hmm. uh, so these, uh, the new devices have a small battery and it's basically like it's a mobile phone connected yeah. to the battery. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. And uh, and they also have uh, artificial intelligence uh, incorporated into it. So even if a person does not know how to actually interpret the images, so they can they just can assess. Yeah, the the they can be sent, and even uh, by uh, artificial intelligence, the images can be analyzed, and they will mm -hmm. know, you know, by whether the the person who is actually handling the device will know whether it's a normal uh, image or if it's a uh, or if it is suspicious or it is cancer. So uh, these have, it's, it's a very exciting world actually. And uh, a lot, uh, you know, we're going to look at artificial intelligence is going to really help countries like us where we have shortage of manpower, trained manpower to do the screening and treatment. Last year, ma'am, the training was done for the smart scope at Subjan Hospital. Yes. We were celebrating Women's Day that time, no, non-COVID era. Even Dr. Kavita was part of it. So that was very good. Uh, that smart scope. Yes. Just like a mobile. Yeah. A very useful uh, workshop yes. that we had. Yes, yes. Dr. Kavita also was a part of it. Yes, yes. 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 So, people from all over India had come. So, a few people from every state were selected. So, then that smart scope training was done, ma'am. So, we can do it again, Dr. Sarita. Yeah, of yes, we can. Mm -hmm. I yeah. started with the talk, um, the session with speculum examination, and I will try to end it here that every gynecologist must do a speculum examination of every woman, that itself is a very good screening tool. Exactly. For yes. cervix, yes. vagina, and uh, such good uh, speculums, cascos are available now, thin yes. tips, very easy to insert. And Dr. Kavita, please uh, keep one session or lectures or in the clinical meetings, uh, how to insert a speculum examination without causing discomfort <laughs> to the patient. Right. And that <laughs> itself be a good screen. <laughs> Ma'am, <laughs> like, talk on that. <laughs> yeah. so Ma'am, you wouldn't believe, Ma'am, Dr. Lakhvi, you people had trained us so well for this Cusco examination that in my private practice, you know, I got so used to doing Cusco that I was alone doing my MTPs with the Cusco without anybody's help. <laughs> because this Cusco was so good. You yeah, know, you could manipulate, well. manage so well. Small one, of, one of our PGs yes. just mm. met me after many years, 10, 15 years. And she says, ma'am, I remember you 40 to 50 times in a day. I said, who, no, nobody can remember anybody so many times a day. <laughs> she says, well, she has a very busy practice. She says, whenever I insert a speculum examination, <laughs> I always remember how to insert it because you taught it. She said, I think of you that you taught me it should be wet with saline or something. A dry speculum should not be pushed in yes. and put it in vertically and then right. turn it. So yes. make the patient feel relaxed. She said, 
40 to 50 times. I thought she's really making fun of me, what she's saying. But uh, no, the, ma'am, really as simple matters. as a small procedure, yes, or small absolutely. this thing can be important. Right, right. We have a look at like that. Can yes. you thank you, ma'am, for highlighting all of you. It's very much thank needed. You. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Kavita, also really for arranging it so well and uh, including me also in this. Thank, thank you very you much. For your guidance, blessings and help. <laughs> now, we shall have a bigger one in Delhi with Dr. Lakhveer, ma'am, and yes. all your faculty from Punjab. Yes, you must all come, join us over the yes. virtual World Congress. Yes, that, that they all must. Yes, yes. Right. Thank you all and a very happy relaxing weekend to everybody yeah yes. thank you so much thank and you. have a happy tea now okay yes. <laughs> bye 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 bye, bye.